Amen, amen. It's so incredibly good to see you. Happy Sunday to each and every one of you. Come on and give God a great praise. <laughs> Take a moment to wave to somebody sitting nearby you, in front of you, behind you. If you're online, feel free to, to holler at us online in the chat. We are so, so thankful that you are here. We're thankful to be a church with two locations, both in person and both uh, online. We are grateful indeed. Can you thank the Lord for our music ministry and just the atmosphere, the baptisms, communion? What an incredible, incredible day it has been already, and we're so thankful to see you on today. Thank you for pressing through, making up in your mind. Listen, I'm going to worship today. Nothing's going to stop me from getting to worship to be able to honor God for all he has done in my life. It is so incredibly good to see you this morning, family. Family, I want to invite you, if you will, to open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 2. We are starting a new series entitled The Power of One. And for the next two Sundays, this week and next week, we want to talk about this whole theme of the, the power that's found in unity. What happens when we come together and we work together? The things that the Lord wants to do in your life and through our church and for his mission is found in this incredible ideal of unity, the power of one. I want to invite you to meet me in Acts chapter 2. I want to read the last six verses of that particular text, and then we'll dive in on this morning. Acts chapter 2 reads this verse, beginning at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to, to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. 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 For a few moments, family, this morning I want to talk about a unified church, a unified church. Friends, it is no secret that you and I live in incredibly challenging times. The recent mass shootings in Buffalo, Uvalde, and Tulsa remind us of the difficult and broken world in which we live in, the senseless violence that we continue to see on the news. And this year alone, 232 mass shootings have already occurred. It's not only the mass shooting, but then we also are facing this housing crisis where the sharp record high prices of homes and the rising interest rates have many unable to be able to afford the home they always long for. If it's not the housing crisis, it then moves to inflation, gas prices and food prices and living expenses. You fill up your tank and you try not to cuss as you saw that thing keep ticking up, ticking up, ticking up. You were mad the rest of the day because you just could not believe that your tank took that much gas. Everything seems to be going up. Everything you spend, it seems that your money, any extra that you got seems to be taken by so many extra expenses. The kids get out of school and they need more money. It, it, just, it, just, it seems like you catch it on all sides. We're living with a senseless war in the Ukraine ignited by a reckless dictator that is having a global impact. We're dealing with a stagnant political system. Texas, one of 18 states with restrictive voter laws specifically designed to keep people from color from voting. We desperately need gun reform, and yet politicians talk about it, but no one seems to want to do anything about it. It's a shame when you got to have a higher age limit to rent a car than to buy a gun. We need universal and expanded background checks. We need a ban on assault weapons. All of these are the challenging world in which you and I live in. And if that's not enough on a national level, even internet, you, you've got stuff in your own home that you're dealing with. 
You got the challenges sometimes of relationships or finances or emotional struggles and dilemmas that you find yourself wrestling with from day to day. But friends, the truth of the matter is this. We are not the first ones to ever live through challenging times. Matter of fact, friends, some of you in this room, this is not the first time that you've had to deal with difficulties in your life. If you look back over your story, you know exactly what God can do through lean seasons and difficult seasons and challenging seasons. You're, you, you, this is not your first time. And friends, not only is it not our first time, but in Acts chapter 2, God's church, the people of God are going through challenging times. They are under the regime of an oppressive Roman government. They are dealing with poverty. They are dealing with financial challenges that have one class separated from another class. They are dealing with the challenges that we face, but on a different level. And yet in Acts chapter 2, in the middle of all of these challenges, in the middle of them watching their Savior, Jesus Christ, dying and then being resurrected, in that very moment, 50 days later, all on that Pentecost Sunday, it's on that day that the church is birth. It's interesting that, that in Acts chapter 2, we find the church of Jesus Christ being birthed for the very first time. It's interesting and in challenging times that God's church ought to be at its best. In challenging times, in difficult times, it's in those very moments where there the church of God ought to be who God has called it to be. It does not mean that it eliminates the challenges, but it does mean it gives us power to cope with the challenges. This is Acts chapter 2. We get a picture of the church at its very inception. And it's, at its very inception, we get to discover what the church ought to look like. And I want to I lift up for you just a few ideas out of this passage. Let God's Word speak to us about the church, this church. Here's the first thing we discover about the church. First of all, the church has unity. Somebody say unity. It's an incredible, powerful concept right in verse 44 where it says this, all the believers were together, they had everything in common. That he, is, he describes to us, he reminds us that there is something incredibly distinct when God's people get on the same page. I, I love the way Ephesians chapter 4 and 4 says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope from which you were called, there is one Lord and one faith and one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. One of the things that we have to remind ourselves, that if we're going to move and do the work God has called us to do as a Concord Church family, then we must remember how crucial it is for us to protect the unity that God has given. Look at the text. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They were unified in the work to which God had called them. We will unpack what that work is momentarily, but I want you to catch that he has called us to be unified as a church family. This, this month marks the 48th church anniversary of our church. Our church will be in, in existence for 48 years come the fourth Sunday of this month. Unbelievable. 48 years, Elder Cunningham, 48 years that, that God has been faithful to our church. We have sought to be a unified church attempting to do God's work that he's called us to. Do you know the very name Concord is a musical term that means harmony? And the reason our church is called Concord is that our church, our, our founding pastor, he had, he had pastored a previous church. And for five years, that church was in court every single year. And so when he left that church and God gave him a vision to start this church, he said, I want to start a church that has some unity. I want to start a church that knows what it's like to have harmony, to know what it's like to work together, not fight against one another, to be on the same page. What's wrong with us when we are as Christians cannot trust God and follow God and have some unity about what he's called us to? And Concord, I want you to know, y'all, listen, we have to be unified. 
that we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. He's called us to make disciples. That's what he's called us to. And it's interesting that God would put so many different people in one church family. He got us all in one church family. We've got builders, which are that great generation that has helped put a foundation on so many of us here in this room, those primarily 65 and up, the builders in this room. We've got boomers, those in their 50s and 60s that are in many in retirement or reaching toward retirement that, that, have, that have given us such a strong foundation in life. Then we've got Gen X, that's my group, in your, in your, in your early 40s to mid 50s. And then you've got, after your, after your, your Gen X, you've then got millennials, that's, that's, that's around 40 and around 25. And then after that, you've got Gen Z that, that's coming up right behind us. You've got five generations in one church. Isn't that a beautiful thing? It's beautiful. Matter of fact, I want you to help me with something real quickly. If you've joined Concord in the last five years, would you please stand? No, 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 let me do it this way. Hold on, hold on. Let me do it. Me, yeah. Last five years, would you please stand? Last five years, would you please stand? Join Concord. Last five years, please stand. Come on, come on. Woo. Wow. If you're online, you can type in the chat what year you born. Come on, five years. Come on, give God praise. Last five years, man, y'all, y'all been rolling with us. We are so thankful for with you. All right, you may be seated. You joined Concord in the last 10 years, so five years stay more. If you've been here from five to 10 years, you please stand. Five to 10 years, five to 10 years, you please stand. Beautiful, beautiful five to 10. We see you. We thank God for you. You may be seated. Those in the building from 10 to 15 years, let me see you stand. 10 to 15, come on. 10 to 15, I see you. I see you. I see you. 10 to 15, I see you. I see you. I see you. All right, 10. Let me see you from 15 to 20 years. Come on. 15 to 20 years, let me see you. Come on, that's my group. I see you, Jeremy. Come on, that's my group. All right, 15 to 20. All right, and then the last group, anybody been here longer than 20 years? That's our foundation. You've been here. You've been through it all, man. Listen, come on, let's give it up for them. 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 Hey. And it's fascinating, man, that God sends us all and puts us all together, right? That we need each other, that a unified church understands that unity doesn't mean uniformity. I forgot to call out the people that haven't joined yet. That's the other group. I forgot y'all. You, you ain't a, you know, you with us. You, you all the way with us. Listen, we in this thing. I, I, y'all want to stand too, the people that just close you. You thinking about it. You think, y'all want to stand too. Come on, if you're just thinking about it, you already part of the family. You want to stand too. Hey, girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see you. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Come on, come on, come on. All right. I see you up top. I got you. All right, all right. That's right, we all part of the family. We all part of the family, right? And, and so, and so, but, but God puts us all together. And you know what's crazy about God's work, right? He puts us all together, he expects us to be unified. In some of our church, in, in some parts of our church, we've got the grandmother, the mother, and the granddaughter. We got three generations, in some cases in one church. And sometimes, y'all, it's hard to, to make everybody happy. Somebody, we, we sing this, and somebody says, that's my jam. And then somebody else says, man, why don't we sing some hymns? How come we don't sing more hymns? <laughs> somebody hands go up and somebody hands go down, depending on the song. Y'all be working us up here, man. We, we trying, we trying, but, we, but, but just think about this. We got to stay unified. We got to stay unified, right? It's not about one generation or another generation. It's not about what I like. It's not about what somebody else likes. Listen, if the main thing is the main thing of making disciples, listen, it really don't matter, right? If it's about making disciples and, and doing the work he's called us to, right, I can adjust so that we can protect the unity of the church that God has called us to. We got to stay unified. Look at somebody and tell them, stay unified. We got to stay unified. We, we got to stay on the same page. All right, we got to stay on the same page, right? We, we got to stay on, it says unity is the other piece. I want you to, this is what the church does. All their differences, they have their, ethnic, they have their ethnicity differences, they have their societal differences, they have all kinds of different, but they show up and they demonstrate unity. Here's the second thing they do. Not only do they have unity, but secondly, they also grow. Somebody say grow. Look at verse 42. 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer, right? So, so if you read early in the text, many of these people have just gotten saved. I mean, they've they just come to know Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, and say, matter of fact, verse 41 says that, that Peter has preached, and when he finishes preaching, 3,000 people accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And these 3,000 people, they're able to get on the same page, but watch what they do. They are devoted to the disciples' teaching. I love this piece, right? He talks about their devotion to the Word of God. That the, the way they are unified, they are unified and that all of them are seeking to know and follow and trust the Word of God in their life. If we're, gonna, if we're ever going to be the church God has called us to be, if we're ever going to be able to accomplish the things that God has called us to as a church, it's going to require that you and I have a deep devotion to the Word of God. And, and a devotion to the Word of God is, is, yes, it's important for us to show up and be engaged on Sunday mornings, but it also means that the Word of God needs to be a daily part of your life. It, it means that you've got to be devoted to the Word of God, that you've got to make it a part of your regular daily routine. I don't care if you use you version on your phone, or I don't care if you read a chapter a day, but listen, friends, if we're going to be unified, if you read the Word, and I read the Word, and you read the Word, and you read the Word, God's going to grow all of us to where He wants us to be. And friends... When you live in a challenging world with mass shootings and inflation and issues on your job and issues in your family, do you think you can handle that on your own? Do you think you can get yourself and think your way through your own problems? No, you need the Word of God in your life. Listen, you need the Word because what's in you is what comes out of you when life squeezes you, when life pressures you. If you don't have the Word in you, you won't come out the right way. You won't respond the right way. But when the Word is planted on the inside, it gives you the strength and the stamina to deal with whatever comes at you. The reason you can keep your head up and keep trusting God and keep believing for better is because the Word has been planted planted on the inside of your life. Somebody say, thank you for his word. He says, they, they, they have the word of God that's in them. But notice the text says, they also have this fellowship. And in the Greek, that is the word koinonia. It, it is this sharing of life together. That the reason the church community is so important is that God never designed us to live the Christian life by ourselves. That it's not us just, just alone in my own spiritual journey, in my own spiritual pursuit. No, koinonia is the sharing together. It's when you hurt, I hurt. When you win, I win. It's when you cry, I cry. When you need prayer, I'm going to pray for you. It's the sharing that we need each other. This is the way in which God has called us to, that there is something incredibly to say. They are, they are growing in the Word of God. They are growing in fellowship and connection as they share together because we desperately need each other. But catch this one, they're also growing in prayer. It's right there, y'all. Matter of fact, it's not just in Acts 2. But when you read the entire book of Acts, you will notice that prayer is a thread that runs through the entire book. That that's prayer, why we pray, the reason we pray at the start of our service is because prayer is what we do. We, we, we understand that the church is the, is, the, is the power source for the kingdom of God to do its work. We know that when the church prays, legislation can be changed. When the church prays, the right officers and the right politicians can be positioned to help advance a kingdom agenda. When the church prays, he can keep us and cover us and sustain us in a trying and difficult world. When the church prays, he can help us through recession. Help us through inflation because we understand that in my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. It might be tight. It might be a struggle, but my God's still going to get me through. How do I know? Because this ain't the first time he got me through. 
This ain't the first time that things have been lean. This ain't the first time that I thought I might lose my job. This ain't the first time that I had difficulty. I pray because prayer gets us through. And when the church prays, oh, things really start to happen. When you get your friend to pray and the church to pray and somebody else to pray, his power shows up and his power changes situations. Somebody knows what I'm talking about? You know that something happens when we start praying and we start believing and we start trusting and we start thinking and we start leaning. God starts to move. Maybe the brokenness of our world is a call on the church to pray for this mess, to pray for gun legislation, to pray for our children, to pray for this racism, to pray against this voter suppression, to pray against the brokenness, to pray for the mental health challenges. But when we finish praying, there's work to do. You can't pray and sit on your butt. No, you got to pray and go vote. You got to pray and put some legislation. You got to pray and change your own habits. Prayer is only part of the problem, part of the solution, because faith without works is dead. He declares to us, I need the church to be a praying church. And I want you to understand that sometimes you may not get your prayer request to the church. And you can go online and complete a form, but sometimes you may not be able to do all that. Sometimes you just need one person you can call and say, listen, I just need you to join in on me on this thing. I just need you to pray with me. Can, can we covet to pray for the next 21 days at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. for God to do this? And let's just see what God does because God has designed us for community. Unified church, they pray together. Unified church, they are they're willing to fellowship together. A unified church is willing to grow in God's word together. But let me keep going. Verse 45. Verse 45 says this. When they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Uh, this is what a unified church is. A unified church is willing to give, and a unified church is willing to serve. Willing to give, willing to serve. Here it is. I want you to catch. I, 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 I want you to see the unity in the text. I didn't highlight this earlier, but I want you to notice that most of the pronouns are all plural. I, you may have slept through English class that day, that grammar class. Miss, Miss Wilson, you and parts of speech didn't get along very well. I understand. Trust me, I completely understand. But, but I want you to catch all of the, of the plural words. Look at this. In verse 45, they and, and anyone. Verse 46, they and together and they and together and look at verse 47 all the people and you can trace the entire passage because this is a unified church on mission for God's work look at what the, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone that was in need this this is the church that is a generous church they're not a greedy church they are a generous church. Matter of fact, I mean, if you ever want to see this really well, you can see it at the end of Acts chapter 4, uh, around verse 36, Acts 4, 36. The text says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is, this is what they did, y'all. They, they were generous to the church. They, they were trying to find ways to give to the church. They were trying to find ways to bless the work and ministry of the church. A, a member just a few weeks ago gave a generous gift and said, listen, I just, I just want to want to support the work and ministry of the church. It's, it is this generosity. That's how we move forward when each of us understands that God blesses us, not just for it to stay in your hands, but sometimes God blesses you to pass through your hands and to prove it back in the his hands so his work can 
be done. Sometimes God wants to do more in your life, but if he can't trust your hands to be able to pass some stuff on to the work and ministry of God, maybe you are limiting what God wants to do. They are generous to God. They are generous to God. This church is 48 years old, and the reason we are 48 years old is because generous people kept showing up. Generous people kept on giving. Generous people kept on being sacrificial. Generous people kept on supporting the work of God. You in this room, in the middle of a pandemic, you kept on giving to God. In the middle of crisis, you kept on giving to God. You kept on honoring God. You kept on sacrificing to God. You, you kept God at the top of your budget. You didn't make God an afterthought, but you said, God, I, I want to I bless you. And God, I want to honor you. And you kept him at, on your budget, and you kept on giving. And as you gave, God's ministry went forward because you were generous to God. You were generous to God, just like Barnabas. It's not just giving, but it's also serving. Because notice they are, they're not just giving, but they're giving also to anyone that's in need. They are, they are sacrificial. They are finding ways to serve their immediate context. That's why we are so thankful and, and, of, of the work that our church has been able to do because of your generosity in helping to, to, to impact our immediate community. We, we, have a, we have a partnership with Harmony Community Development Corporation that every week they are, they are feeding people in our, in our community. Every week they are keeping food on the tables. So far this year they fed 2,000 families and 5,000 individuals, over 150,000 pounds of food. You give and they're able to bless other people. And Harmony, not only is it doing the food pantry, but we also have a counseling center. And this year alone, over 400 people have been seen in the counseling center getting help with their mental health, getting help with how to manage stuff, getting help with the stress and relationships that come in life. And this year, with their partnership with grants they've received, they've been able to help over 400 people with $1.4 million in rental assistance and Mortgage says they prevented 74 evictions have been presented because of them. 30 people that once were homeless are now housed. See, this is the work. This is the work that God has called us to do. We can't fix everything, but we can do something. Let the church be the church and do the work of the church, and we can change our situation. This is who we are. This is who we are. Faith without works is dead. That's what James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 says. And specifically the black church. I mean, the black church has been the hub for hope in its community. It was in the black church that many of our HBCUs were started. It was in the black church that hospitals were started. It was in the black church that we began to provide the community and the foundation. The civil rights movement is birthed out of the black church, and people want to get critical, but if the black church is not who it is, we would not be where we are today. Let the church be the church. They, they, they are giving and they are serving. But then this last thing, and I'm done, they also are worshiping. They also are worshiping. I love verse 46. Look at what it says, y'all. And every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in the homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. I want you to notice that, that this is what worship looks like. They, 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 are, they are meeting together corporately, which means they show up to the local. The temple is still there, and they're showing up there perhaps for some sort of worship or conversation or, or engagement with other followers. I, I love that part. It's important to, to gather together. We thank God for you gathering with us on Sunday mornings. But I also want you to notice there's also something in the text that they also broke bread house to house which means there was some gathering right here and there was some gathering right at home. They, they, were, they were able to do both as they gathered and they worshiped God. 
that worship is not confined just to what happens in this building alone, but you can worship in your house right now on Sunday morning as you watch worship. You can, you can worship God right there. You can worship God on your way to your job. Listen, keep your eyes open, but you can worship him all the way till you get there. You can worship him at your computer as you type out your thanksgivings to God and you reflect on who he is. You can worship in all these places, but it's both. It's the gathering, but it's also small groups and grow groups and sharing life together that makes the church who the church has been called to be. In verse 47, they're praising God and they are enjoying the favor of God for all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. And he says, he, he literally is telling them, they, they begin to praise God together. And they begin to honor God together. And what happens in that context is the Lord starts sending people. The Lord starts sending people that, that wants what they have, that sees the impact and the movement on their life and says, I want what they have. I want what God is doing in their lives. And the Lord starts adding to their life. It's a worshiping church. And I believe all this then leads us to verse 43, where it says, and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. I just believe when the church gets unified, when the church starts seeking the word of God, when the church is generous to God, when the church is serving his mission, and not just corporately, but individually, because you do understand that we are the church collectively, but you're also church as an individual person. That, that you are a part of the church. So where you go, the church goes. Where you serve, the church serves. And I believe that when we live this out and do this work, I believe the unity begins to take a hold of us. And I believe that miracles can take place in God's church when God's people have surrendered and focused and are serving his mission. It may not be the miracles that you saw with the apostles, but I believe right now, even in this room, the miracle of salvation can take place. The miracle of forgiveness can take place. I believe even in this room, the miracle of a changed life for a man can take place or the changed life for a woman can take place. I believe miracles can happen when the church gets focused on what God has called it to do. When the church keeps lifting up the name of Jesus, when the church is about the work of ministry and the work in changing the city, when the church is concerned about God getting the glory and not just the name getting the glory or the person getting the glory, I believe miracles start to happen and things begin to change. And all we can do is say, look at God, go, God, go. God, do it for Concord. God, do it for every church in our city. God, use us in a way that only you can get the glory of. I believe miracles can happen. It was in April of 2020 and 20. There, there, the one of our members was in the hospital. She had, she had gone in with a fever. She had gone in with a mild diagnosis. And yet as she went into the hospital there, Miss Lucille went in and got checked in there at the hospital. And there they told her, we need you to stay. She got diagnosed with COVID and eventually it would lead to double pneumonia in both of her lungs. They would end up ventilating her. And there, as they would ventilate her, her family would begin to reach out to the church and reach out to others and say, listen, would you please pray for my mother? And there the church began to pray for Miss Lucille as she was now in the hospital, not, not just why we thought one week, but not one week, but then one week turned to two weeks. And two weeks turned to three weeks. At this point, the doctors began to believe that there was, there was no no more brain function. She had been on a ventilator some three weeks and it looked like everything was ending. Matter of fact, the doctors told her family, begin to make your funeral arrangements because there's not much left. We don't see any activity and there's not much there. 
But the church kept on praying and family kept on praying. And 44 days later, after they had tried multiple times, three times to take her off, but her body wouldn't bounce back. But 44 days later, after much prayer, after much believing, much fasting, they took her out the ventilator. She would later come out the hospital. She would later come back to church. And I would say, listen, miracles can happen. Miracles can happen. Miracles can happen when the church is the church. Listen, God is still answering prayers. God is still breaking chains. God is still making old new. God is still making fresh people and fresh situations and changing. God is still doing miracles. But it only happens when the church is the church. That when you and I find our places, and we devote ourselves to God and we seek God together, God can do something in this church that can't nobody get credit for. The doctors were amazed with Miss Lucille's story. The family was amazed. All we knew was that we serve a God that's a healer of every disease. We serve a God that when the doctors don't know what to do, he knows what to do. We serve a God that can help us even in times of crisis no matter what we may face. Would you stand with me all over the room today? Would you stand with me today? Come on and bless God together in this room. Come on and bless him for the church. Bless him for the church. Bless him. Bless him for the church. Bless him for the church. Would you pray with us all over this room? I want you to pray, Lord, help our church to be who you've called it to be. Come on, would you pray for our church? All over this room, would you just bow your head for a moment and just begin to pray to God and say, Lord, I pray for our church. Lord, I pray for me. Worship, grow, serve, give. Lord, I pray, I pray, I pray. Help our church to be what you've called it to be. Come on, let's pray for it all over this room. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for me. I pray, Lord, help me to lean in to be what you've called me to be wherever you place me in the city wherever you place me in my family. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I pray for healing in my heart for some that may have been dealing with church hurt in some season of their life. I pray for healing and restoration. I pray, God, the church may be what you've called it to be. I pray for my church, Lord, that you would protect our integrity. I pray, God, for our leaders at our church. I pray for every member in our church. I pray for every member online in our church. I pray for every church in our city. Come on, would you call it out to the Lord together? Let's believe him for what he's able to do. Let's believe him for what he's able to do. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do it. Pray for our church. Pray for unity. Pray for unity. Pray for unity. That we won't be judging one of another. We won't try to make it just about us. That we'll be flexible and fluid <laughs> as we try to reach the loss. Come on, Lord, help my church. Help our church. Help our church. Help our church. Help our church to be who you've called it to be. Help me, God, to play my role, to be who you've called me to be. We pray for every church in the city of Dallas. Come on, pray for every church, every church in the city. Every, every state, sit, <clears throat> church in the nation, just, Lord, we pray for the church, your church, to do your work and be who you called it to be. Say, I need, I need.